Hello and welcome to the third lecture in this ongoing series of lectures on chemistry in everyday life. In today's lecture, we will study about certain diseases and drugs which are used uh, for those diseases based upon our knowledge which we have accrued in the first two lectures about receptors, enzyme and mechanism of drugs. So, we will uh, rather apply that knowledge in today's lecture. We will talk about in this lecture about uh, antacids, antihistamines, uh, analgesics, tranquilizers, antibiotics, antiseptics and disinfectants. So, we will straight away move to the first antacids. Antacids, uh, to know about antacids, one must also appreciate uh, the fact that the pH of our stomach is highly acidic. It is around 1.5 to 2.5 when empty and it raises to 5 to 6 when food is ingested. The acid which is which it contains is hydrochloric acid. Then what happens is, uh, well acid needs to be secreted when food enters the body. Okay. But under certain uh, you know uh, diseased conditions, this acid uh, can actually accumulate in stomach even when food is not to be ingested. It can happen under uh, the following conditions like if somebody is uh, consuming alcohol, if somebody is anxious, uh, eating certain kind of foods like primarily junk foods tend to release a lot more amount of HCl than required. Smoking, uh, then certain drugs as a side effect of those drugs like aspirin and all others uh, NSAIDs, non-inflammatory uh, steroidal, uh, uh, inflammatory non-steroidal drugs and then it can also happen because of somebody's stressful conditions. Now, the problem is once this unwarranted acid accumulates in stomach, it starts to corrode the epithelial lining of the neighboring tissues, for example, gastric epithelium and then it creates ulcers like small wounds, right. So, it can create gastric ulcers in stomach, it can create duodenum ulcers, it can create esophagus ulcer or in general it can create gastritis which is inflammation of the gastric mucosa which is uh, you know that epithelia lining uh, the stomach cavity. So, it can get uh, you know in general it can get inflamed. So, which means that excessive release of HCl is a pathogenic condition right. And since it is an acid one most natural antacid which might come to our mind as chemists would be addition of a base right. So, that a neutralization reaction would ensue uh, with addition of gastric acid to uh, the base we are talking about and that would result in formation of a buffer. So, that should be the uh, you know the most basic kind of antacid uh, available uh, through uh, this drug design maneuvers. And of course, this is the case. So, one uh, can find a lot of such antacids, a lot of such bases in the market and based upon the nature of those antacids, we can have systematic antacids uh, for example, sodium bicarbonate. Now, when we say something as systematic antacid, what do we mean by that? Generally, all these antacids which fall in this category of systematic antacids are highly water soluble. So, when a salt is very highly water soluble, what it is going to do? It is going to be readily absorbed in bloodstream, right. And as soon as it gets into the bloodstream, now it, it has no role to do in bloodstream, right, because it is going to neutralize acid which is present in stomach, not in bloodstream. But as and when it gets into the bloodstream, it tends to give a lot of metal ions and then those metal ions starts to accumulate systematically in the uh, blood circulation, which if goes unchecked for a prolonged use of such antacids, it can lead to uh, uh, you know a stage where blood plasma becomes highly alkaline and that is a very toxic condition for a human being, right. 
So that is what we mean by systematic antacids. When we talk of non-systematic antacids, we talk of uh, certain salts, certain compounds, uh, basic compounds, which are not that soluble in water. Now, if they are not that soluble in water, they will remain poorly absorbed in uh, the bloodstream. So then this kind of, uh, you know, alkaline condition of blood plasma would not probably exist. And hence, these are much safer in comparison to systematic antacids. Antacids falling in this category include salts of aluminium, salts of magnesium, salts of calcium and you can go and check, uh, you know, in a pharmaceutical store, all these are available on counter. You can, uh, just for the sake of curiosity, you can just go and have a look what kind of salts are being uh, used as antacids there. Apart from all that, there are also certain miscellaneous antacids, uh, something of the kind uh, alginates, which are, uh, you know, again, which are polymeric uh, compounds in nature, they are polymeric sugars, or like uh, samathicone, which are again polymeric compounds, something of the kind of uh, some polymeric silicas. Uh, but primary, primarily when we talk of antacids, we talk of uh, generally those uh, metal salts. Now, if one is to look for an ideal antacid, uh, there are certain properties which an ideal antacid must possess. It should exert effect rapidly and over a long period of time. Then a uh, reaction of an antacid with hydrochloric acid should not cause large evolution of gas, should not be constipated or laxative, constipative or laxative, right? should make a buffer in the range of 4 to 6 pH. It should not be absorber or cause systemic alcoholysis, something of the kind I talked about uh, when I, in the previous slide when I talked about sodium bicarbonate. Then it should also not interfere with absorption of food and uh, last but not the least, it should be inexpensive. Well, these are too many characteristic uh, to be kind of expected in an antacid and as expected, unfortunately, uh, none of the antacids available so far would meet all these criteria mentioned in the previous slide and every antacid would have one side effect or the other, especially when it is used for a longer period of time. For example, when we talk of sodium bicarbonate, number one, it is a systematic uh, antacid and secondly, uh, it tends to also release carbon dioxide in stomach. So, uh, you know, it, it produces, it has limitations on two counts. Uh, similarly, because you have a lot of accumulation of sodium over a prolonged period, it can also lead to heart failures. Uh, so, for patients which are on low sodium diet, they are never fed on antacids which are of this kind. Aluminum hydroxide, it is a good antacid, but it causes constipation. Uh, likewise, when we talk of magnesium salts, they are, uh, they are having an opposite effect, they act as laxative. Okay? Uh, whereas, calcium carbonate upon prolonged uh, uses, it can cause hypercalcemia, so which means a lot of calcium accumulation in the body. Now, sometimes to uh, kind of counteract, to circumvent these side effects, uh, one method which uh, uh, chemists use is uh, they give you a cocktail or a mixture of uh, more than one, more two or more than two uh, components. For example, magnesium and aluminum salts can be formulated in one antacid. So, what is going to happen? Magnesium salts, uh, they are supposed to be faster acting whereas aluminum salts, they are supposed to be long lasting uh, as far as uh, antacid uh, is concerned. Likewise, I told you magnesium salts are generally laxatives whereas aluminum salts, they cause constipation. So, again uh, kind of they both uh, uh, compensate for each other's uh, deficiencies and drawbacks. Now, uh, there is another kind of anti-ulcer compound and those compounds are antihistamines. These compounds work through an entirely different mechanism. Okay, and that's very. Uh, th there's a very interesting chemistry around antihistamines as far as uh, anti-ulcer activity is concerned. 
Uh, before then, we must understand histamines. So, histamine is this structure shown on your screens. It is an imidazole uh, scaffold which is joined to an amine through an ethylenic bridge and this amine uh, is in quaternarized state, it is uh, uh, it's it's in a protonated state under normal uh, plasma pH. Now, what this compound does? Generally, this compound increases permeability of blood vessels. It is actually a hormone. It can also be neurotransmitter at times, uh, you know, based upon the action we are talking about. So, I spoke about the action of hormones or neurotransmitters and I told you in the previous lecture that these are nothing but messenger molecules and these messenger molecules then uh, fit on certain receptors and based upon their binding on those receptors, a uh, certain pharmaceutical effect uh, would be produced, right. So, it means it has to bind to certain receptor. Now, what that receptor is going to do? Once it fits into that receptor, that receptor uh, opens up and lays down a cascade of activities which eventually lead to increased permeability of blood vessels. It also activates immune system. Now, both these activities are important when let us say some pathogen has entered the body, right. For example, if somebody has got certain viral infections, let us say it is uh, you know somebody suffering from cold. So, uh, then a lot of uh, a lot of this histamine activity would be incited and the impact physiological impact of this histamine this activity would be that uh, a person would exhibit symptoms as seen during uh, cold, right. So, you would see that runny nose, you would see redness of nose, it is all because of increased permeability of blood vessels and then you have since your immune system is activated, uh, you know, uh, so it tends to wash off all those uh, uh, viral particles and all. Uh, the major limitation is that it can also happen when somebody is allergic to certain things like for example, dust or pollens. So, the body is not able to differentiate between a virus and a dust particle and the same uh, phenomena can actually be exerted and a person can get uh, you know all the same symptoms uh, of and you know something which happens during hay fever and all. So, for which there is a class of compounds which uh, we call antihistamines. Now, why I am talking about this which has no relevance to uh, you know the ulcer and uh, anti antacids and all which we are studying. Scientists somewhere down the line realized that histamine is also responsible for uh, production of HCl okay, and production of large amount of HCl. Now, when they started to delve into that, what they found was that uh, these are the uh, parietal cells, cells which are actually manning this, uh, this uh, uh, stomach cavity. So, on these cells uh, generally are present certain receptors and those receptors are able to receive neurotransmitter in the form of acetylcholine and hormones like gastrin and histamines. So, what happens when all the three compounds for example, they bind to their respective receptors present on the parietal cell. Due to their action, uh, they act as an agonists and they incite this parietal cell to release a lot of amount of HCl, which means that antihistamines can actually act as also antacid compounds, right. But there was a catch. So, scientists thereafter realized that there are two entirely different kinds of receptors, H1 receptors and H2 receptors. Both are histamine receptors, okay. So, the important thing scientists figured out was there were two kinds of receptors. Both these receptors acted upon histamines. One was H1 receptors and another one they found was H2 receptors. Now, H1 receptors, they were histamine receptors basically involved in inflammation process. Something of the kind I told you in two slides uh, before this slide, where I spoke about hay fever and all. Now, the second type of receptors, which was this H2 receptor, they were responsible for gastric acid secretion. And it is this H2 receptor, which was of use to scientists in order to develop an anti-ulcer compound. 
So now the second question was since uh, this histamine was an agonist for this receptor, we must be able to uh, find out an antagonist for this particular receptor. So what it meant was we must effectively convert the agonist which was histamine into another compound which will act as an antagonist. Now there is this very important point uh, where we know what is an agonist and we tend to develop an antagonist primarily based upon a platform which agonist provides us. Okay? To understand this I will provide you an hypothetical situation. Let us assume that here lies a receptor and this receptor is acting as a gatekeeper for this ion channel. Okay? Now there is a compound, this compound here which acts as an agonist of this particular receptor. Now by being an agonist it means that as soon as this agonist binds to the receptor binding site due to induced fit mechanism which I spoke about in the previous lecture there would be uh, you know certain conformational changes in the receptors, uh, receptor shape also and because of that change in the receptor you see this gatekeeper this gate has now opened up because of agonist binding to it. What does it mean? It means that uh, probably what has happened is that this agonist uh, has been able to bind initially to the active site but the binding was not very strong and there were still certain more prospective areas of binding let us say here which were not really uh, ideally conformationally uh, designed or placed. So in order to kind of uh, reinforce this binding there has to have certain structural changes in the receptor. Now by being uh, you know changed into this more constricted shape it has brought effectively this carboxylic group quite in proximal distance to this uh, protonated amine and then this ionic bond has been forged. But because as soon as this uh, interaction has taken place it has also resulted in opening up of this ion channel. That is what an agonist is going to do. Now we are interested in developing an antagonist right. So what we should do? We should try to design a molecule number one that it should probably be similar to the agonist but it should be designed in such a way that it is able to forge uh, much better interactions with the binding cavity in such a manner that in that case this receptor does not have to change its shape like what has been happening here. So as soon as this antagonist fits into this pocket. Okay. Number one it fits into this pocket much better than the agonist. So if even if there is some agonist present antagonist will always be preferred in this binding site. Number two it fits it in such a manner that uh, there is no change in the receptor and then this ion channel the, that ion channel which we spoke about remain closed. Right? So then what we see is that antagonists generally are better fit than agonist molecules. Now keeping the same philosophy in mind we will try to evaluate how histamine binds in its active site. Again this is more hypothetical this is more cartoonish but it uh, you know it, uh, there are similar binding sites in actuality. So if we look at histamine molecule and it is binding into its active H2 uh, uh, receptor site we find that there are two different kind of uh, binding possible. First is through this uh, protonated amine and that can engage through ionic interactions with the binding site in the active site. Now from this amine there is this flexible 2 carbon chain okay, which leads to this particular uh, uh, imidazole molecule. In this imidazole molecule what we see is, is this imidine unit this amidine part NH, C, H and double bond N and this amidine unit can engage in uh, other hydrogen bonding interactions with the active site. Okay? So basically these are the interactions we are looking at uh, when we are thinking of histamine in its active site. 
So now let us pictureize this whole thing in a context to development of an antagonist. Let us say this histamine molecule as soon as it fits into the active site it changes this particular active site through induced fit mechanism and which means that there is certain space it leaves here right. It has become it has changed its shape from this to this. Now that would mean that if we are able to add to certain steric crowd here for example, let us say steric crowd or certain extra functionality right now we do not know which functionalities will be actually good. But believe that there are certain extra functionalities if we are able to get to this extra functionality on histamine molecule then this molecule will become rather a better fit in comparison to histamine and then this receptor would not have to change shape. And if that does not happen it means we would have developed a perfect antagonist. So keeping this in mind starting from histamine people were able to uh, design a lot of compounds lot of H2 antagonist compounds uh, for example metiamide, for example cimetidine, for example ranitidine and other compounds also and all had been hugely successful molecules. Uh, as far as metiamide is concerned you know what we have changed. So here instead of having now quaternary amine we have replaced it with uh, this kind of uh, thiourea bond right. Uh, the problem with this compound is that patient who suffer from kidney damage they uh, are not susceptible to this molecule. Next one in line was cimetidine. Now in this case cimetidine uh, the basic change is uh, we have now converted this whole thiourea unit from the previous molecule into this guanidine unit. Uh, resulting compound was way less toxic right and it was also more potent and more active in comparison to metiamide. Uh, the other things about cimetidine was it was metabolically stable which means when we talk about some drugs being metabolically stable what do we mean? Every drug when it is ingested it goes through liver right and liver has certain hydrolyzing enzymes. It is a machine of uh, you know a plethora of hydrolyzing enzymes which tends to uh, I told you in the last lecture we tends to get rid of this uh, drug molecule considering it as a foreign particle. So if a drug is metabolically stable it means it is hard for those liver enzymes to then get rid of this molecule. So it stays in the blood for a longer period of time okay. So then it is excreted also largely unchanged. Uh, the other bad thing about this compound is that it is found to inhibit P450 cytochrome oxidase systems in liver. So this P450 cytochrome oxidase is a cluster of enzymes which are hydrolytic enzymes contain all these kind of oxidation, oxidation reduction reactions uh, in the liver uh, for metabolizing action. Which means that if the problem is that if you have other drugs in uh, conjunction with this particular drug cimetidine you need to be very careful and especially if those drugs belong to diazepine, lidocaine, warfarin or theophylline uh, one should be extremely careful taking cimetidine because then these molecules their profile their therapeutic profile will also change because uh, this P450 will probably will not be able to act upon these drugs as effectively as anticipated. And then came ranitidine in this, this uh, uh, basic scaffold has also been changed to a furan. Uh, other things uh, have remained, uh, this has remained and uh, here you have an imidine unit this time. So uh, ranitidine has been a drug with even fewer side effects. It would last longer and was perceived to be 10 times more active than cimetidine. Uh, also importantly for us it would not inhibit P450 cytochrome oxidase system. There are other drugs also which uh, fits into this H2B um, uh, receptor regime. Uh, but uh, you know uh, this does not fall into purview of this lecture we will uh, skipping that uh, here. With this we next come to neurologically active drugs. And when we talk of neurologically active drugs what we mean is the drugs which are able to actually cross uh, effectively blood brain barrier okay. So 
we really when we design a drug uh, unless it is for psychoactive uh, purposes we do not want that drug to unnecessarily cross uh, you know a mesh of capillaries uh, at the blood uh, brain uh, junction so that it doesn't actually enter brain unnecessarily but still there are certain drugs which are able to cross this blood brain barrier and if they happen to cross this blood brain barrier they tend to be generally psychoactive drugs so they would have all the uh, you know kind of sometimes bad effects uh, of psychoactive drugs for example uh, they are uh, addictive drugs sometimes they create uh, you know some kind of euphoric reactions and all that stuff so analgesics which we are going to study and tranquilizers which we are going to study they would fall into this category of neurologically active drugs uh, for today's discussion in case of analgesics we are going to study a molecule called morphine and i think you all know about morphine it's a natural compound uh, obtained from opium uh, those um, opium buds those poppy buds and i think i told about this molecule uh, in the first lecture itself it's one of the most effective painkillers available to medicines i told you that heroin which was a simply modification of this morphine was even more effective but then it was hugely psychoactive it had those tremendous bad effects uh, you know and then it was removed from the market uh, morphine acts in the brain and appear to work by elevating the brain threshold thus decreasing brain's awareness uh, uh, you know brain's awareness of pain problem with morphine is uh, certain side effects uh, and what we are more concerned with is uh, are these side effects like excita excitation euphoria and being addictive and i told you that all of them are because this molecule is very effectively is able to pass this blood brain barrier uh and then create all these uh, all these bad effects now in order to reduce the side effects we certainly need to synthesize morphine analogs to improve activity and to reduce side effects in order to do that again like we did in the previous case it's important for us to understand interaction of morphine with its receptors the receptor with which it binds are called uh, again it's a class of receptors called opioid receptors we are not delving into uh, you know the details of this receptor here uh, what i'll do is this kind of cartoonish presentation of uh, the active site of that receptor and how uh, morphine binds and fits in that cavity there are few things to note here uh, first thing is this aromatic ring in morphine this ring i am talking about is oriented properly with respect to nitrogen so you see nitrogen on one end and this aromatic ring on the other end and you see that this aromatic ring engages through van der waal interactions with this hydrophobic uh, binding site okay the second thing is this phenol functionality so this phenol functionality engages through a hydrogen bond uh, with this uh, active site here the third thing is uh, this protonated amine here so this protonated amine engages through an ionic bond uh, with again uh, you know certain residues in the binding site in addition to all that you see that there is a huge space this hollow this cleft and this cleft is more or less like hydrophobic cleft right so what you notice here is that in this cleft you have on one extreme this protonated amine it means an ionic compound and this ionic compound is joined to this aromatic ring through a two carbon bridge if you consider this one carbon and two carbon bridge and this aromatic ring also contains uh, uh, again you know this uh, polar residue or polar functionality in hydroxy in phenolic uh, in this case here so that should primarily be the pharmacophore or the active molecule okay that's the must uh, in order for any molecule to fit into this cavity so keeping this in mind we know that aromatic ring phenol and nitrogen group in uh, you know along with the two carbon bridge are actually essential for its analgesic property so based upon this this morphine molecule was simplified a great deal and people came out with uh, different type of uh, compounds which showed very good activity very good analgesic activity for example this compound shown on the screen benzomorphones 
likewise uh, this phenazosine or uh, bromazosine and in all these cases you see that the structures are certainly much more simplified than morphine uh, and this this pharmacophore has remained intact so you see this nitrogen you see this two carbon uh, bridge here you see this aromatic ring and you see a phenolic compound uh, a phenolic functionality here as far as uh, phenos, uh, this uh, phenazosine is concerned it's four times more potent than morphine it has a long term analgesic action and it's very low uh, as far as addiction risk is concerned the other compound is 200 times more potent than morphine it's also known as non addictive and uh, then uh, you know the other um, drawbacks associated with morphine are also subdued in this compound coming to tranquilizers so tranquilizers are actually class of drugs which are used for the treatment of stress for the treatment of mild or sometimes severe mental diseases okay you note all the components of tranquilizers all those active molecules which behave as tranquilizers you see those molecules as essential components of sleep inducing drugs okay now these tranquilizers have been found to act again on a receptor and this receptor is called gaba receptor gaba stands for gamma amino butyric acid receptor so basically it receives this uh, uh, gamma amino butyric acid and hence this name has uh, uh, you know been given to this receptor this receptor actually houses or uh, again uh, you know man keep this uh, ion channel and this ion channel is primarily for chloride ions so it allows this chlorine ion chloride ions to uh, go inside the cell okay that's primarily the job of uh, this particular receptor now if you look at this uh, receptor here in more perspective you note that uh, this receptor has binding sites for different kind of molecules uh, one being its uh, natural agonist okay and its natural agonist is actually gaba so it has a binding site for gaba it also has binding sites uh, for the drugs uh, which have been used as agonists uh, for this gaba receptor so those drugs primarily and what we are going to study are uh, barbiturates or benzodiazepines barbiturates because uh, they are a class of barbituric acids and benzodiazepines again this is the structure of a benzodiazepine okay uh, this is a diazepine and that's a benzene ring so you see receptors it has more than one receptor and all those receptors actually do the same job they are agonistic in function it means they help to uh, make this flow of chloride uh, bigger and bigger inside the cell so let us look at this mode of action in a little bit of details here so in the first picture shown here you have an empty receptor which means there is no agonist natural or man made if this is the case this ion channel is blocked it is stopped it stops an entry of chloride ion into the cell here right as soon as you see in the second picture its natural agonist gaba binds to this uh, receptor uh, this cavity this ion channel is opened the gates are opened which causes chloride ion channels uh, which causes this chloride to enter the cell and hyperpolarize the cell okay now let's say you have given an uh, drug molecule so then uh, binding of gaba and this drug to the receptor it results to even further opening of the channel and it increases the amount of chloride ions going inside what that mean to us now that would mean to us is entry of chloride ions and i would say excessive entry of chloride ions it would hyperpolarize the cell okay so once it gets hyperpolarized it becomes very difficult for this cell to depolarize again and hence uh, it is unable to send the neural excitable or exciting signals you probably understand uh, the neuron chemistry wherein this polarization and depolarization of the cells are actually able to provide in exciting signals across the neurons and that's how the signal is transferred so basically through hyperpolarization you have blocked this uh, polarization of the cell and hence the signal will stop 
and physiologically that would mean that a person will start to feel calm, uh, you know, calm and calm. So the effects would be that a person would feel that soothing and calming effect uh, and probably will go to sleep. Okay. So basically in this screen now we have uh, uh, the, the drugs, tranquilizing drugs and they belong to the, the two classes which I have already shown. So you see diazepam here, you see alprazolam here or oxazepam here. The difference is uh, in the minor change in this uh, diazepam structure like here you have uh, um, you know another cyclic, uh, heterocyclic. Uh, structure uh, in addition to these uh, two diazepine structures here. Likewise in barbiturates one would have uh, veronal, one would have amobarbital and also pentobarbital. Uh, pentobarbital has legendary stories uh, you know during second world war when it was used as a tranquilizer given to uh, those uh, patients, uh, those uh, warriors who were suffering from uh, wounds. Okay, and it is said that it killed more people than saved people because people that time physicians really did not know the dose of these barbiturates. So invariably uh, the patients were fed on more diet of barbiturates and uh, that has its lethal effects. Okay. Well, I just did digressed. So I will come back to the topic and now we will study antimicrobials. Antimicrobials are those chemicals which uh, prevent development or inhibit pathogenic action of microbes. These microbes could be bacteria, fungi, virus or any other parasites. So when we talk of antimicrobial drugs, we talk of antibiotics, we talk of antiseptics and we talk of disinfectants and in this uh, lecture we will study all the three. So let us begin with antibiotics. These are the chemical substances which uh, in low concentrations they inhibit the growth or they destroy bacteria. Okay. As far as mechanism of action of these antibiotics is concerned, we need to first understand a bacterial cell. So this is a diagram of a bacterial cell. What you note here is there is this thick cell wall in addition to the plasma membrane here. All of us, all human beings and all eukaryotes, we do not have this cell wall. We only have this cell membrane, right? So it contains this thick membrane here. And then what you note here is some scattered clusters of protein particles required for uh, its various routine functions. Then you also see this cluster here which is actually those nucleic acids uh, which are its genetic material and then you have this whole uh, all of these present in this uh, liquid matrix which is cytoplasm. So over a period of time the kind of antibiotics we have discovered basically fall in two to three categories. There is this uh, class of antibiotics which actually act upon uh, the cytoplasm which means it acts on the metabolism of the cell and the class of compounds which actually does that are sulfonamides. We will be studying them in detail. The other class of compounds uh, or the drugs are the ones which actually work on the cell wall, which act on the cell wall. So uh, you know in general it ruptures the cell wall and lies the cell. The molecules which, uh, which do that are uh, like penicillin, cephalosporin or cyclosirine. We will also uh, discuss penicillin in detail. Then there are drugs which actually act upon those protein particles and those protein machineries and the drugs falling in this category are chloramphenicol or streptomycins or tetracyclines. Or then there are other drugs which can also act on cellular membranes like polymyxins and others. So with this kind of mode of action of antibacterial drugs, what we are going to study in this lecture are the drugs which inhibit the cell metabolism which means it acts on the uh, cytoplasm and other drugs which inhibit bacterial cell wall synthesis. So we will be discussing sulfonamides and we will be discussing penicillins. All right. So let us begin, discuss about uh, uh, sulfonamides. So as I said these are anti, uh, antibiotic agents or antibacterial agents which inhibit cell metabolism. These are also called antimetabolites. Uh, so uh, the class of compounds I am talking about are sulfonamides. So you see this benzene structure, this is your sulfonamide uh, moiety here, right. 
Now we should understand what kind of metabolism they actually act upon. So I told you they act on a certain metabolism, that's why we call them anti-metabolites, right? So look at the metabolism, look at that particular process on which these sulfonamides uh, react or act. These sulfonamides are competitive inhibitors of dihydroterate synthetase enzyme. Now, we should understand where this enzyme is used and what is the implication of its uh, dysfunction. This enzyme is required to synthesize a very important vitamin even for us humans and that vitamin is folic acid, vitamin B9. Folic acid is in a crucial step, uh, in a very crucial step of its synthesis is uh, you know where one you require pteridine, you require para amino benzoic acid and also glutamic acid and all the three will mix together uh, in this enzyme uh, which uh, this sulfonamide inhibits. So this enzyme uh, is used as a catalyst and this addition reaction takes place which forms folic acid. Sulfonamide being very similar to this para amino benzoic acid in structure it acts as a competitive inhibitor and I hope you can recall your knowledge from my last lecture where I spoke at length about competitive inhibition in case of enzymes. So this uh, sulfonamide acts as a competitive inhibitor of this particular step of this particular enzyme and once this happens, this enzyme is not able to uh, form uh, this folic acid and this is required in its uh, cellular growth. Uh, in uh, the synthesis of its uh, nuclear uh, genetic material. So that does not happen and then the cell would die. Now interesting question which should come to your mind is I told you this is a vitamin which we also require. The advantage for us is that we take it from plants and other sources. We do not have to, we do not have any machinery within us which synthesizes this. Hence we do not have this enzyme. Therefore any molecule which will fit into this enzyme will not affect us, right? It will only affect the pathogen. That is important. Yes, okay. So looking at uh, other properties of sulfonamides, they are active against gram positive uh, bacteria like uh, pneumococcus and meningococcus. They are ineffective against infections such as salmonella driven infections like typhoid. Uh, there are other problems with this, uh, this first line of sulfonamide uh, drugs uh, which was countered and that problem was during its uh, journey in the blood, uh, this sulfonamide tends to get acylated and this acylated compound is actually insoluble in water, so insoluble in blood also and then that happens to block the kidney tubules. Okay. Now uh, the other problem uh, why this happens is because of the acidity of this particular uh, hydrogen attached to this nitrogen here. So what happens is since this particular uh, structure, this uh, uh, thiazole here, this hydrogen is not very acidic, right? And since it is not very acidic, it remains in an unionized uh, form at the normal blood pH and that is why as soon as this nitrogen get acylated, this whole molecule tends to get precipitated in the blood. Okay. So what would be the solution uh, around it? The solution would be to probably enhance acidity of this hydrogen. Okay. And one way to go about it is add more deactivated or electron withdrawing systems. So instead of a thiazole here, we would uh, replace it with this uh, pyrimidine unit. Okay. And what it does is because of having two electronegative nitrogens in the vicinity, it tends to impart uh, you know its electron withdrawing impact and making this hydrogen more acidic. So now uh, this compound even if it is acylated, it remains soluble in blood. Why? It remains soluble in blood because I told you its acidity has increased. So because its acidity has increased, its pK value has decreased and now uh, it will remain in this ionized form under normal blood pH, just like an acidic, a mild acidic compound. 
and that is what we want. If it remains in an ionized form, it is never going to precipitate in blood, okay? it will remain there in solution. So, this compound is much more soluble and way more, uh, uh, way less toxic, this sulfur diazine. That is the second line of these sulfur drugs and likewise, uh, you would have other uh, sulfonamides, uh, sulfonamide molecules as well. So, next we come to the other class of antibiotics which work through inhibition of cell wall uh, uh, synthesis. Okay? And I told you these are the drug molecules like penicillin or cephalosporins and others. There are certain trademark features of this, uh, these kind of molecules, the most primary structure being presence of this beta lactam ring here. Okay? So, beta lactam, this is an alpha position, nitrogen you count in this fashion. So, uh, from nitrogen you will count, this is alpha, this is beta and hence you found this beta lactam ring here. Now, uh, again this will not impact animals or humans, it will only impact bacteria because we do not have cell wall, right. So, we remained unaffected by penicillin or cephalosporin, so uh, less side effects. As far as discovery of penicillin is concerned, I hope all of you are aware it is one of uh, those most serendipitous experiments ever conducted in the history of mankind. Uh, you probably are aware Fleming was, Alexander Fleming was the discoverer of this molecule and it was out of serendipity. He left his petri dish in which he was growing Staphylococcus bacteria. He left it, went for a vacation. And during this while, there were spores of uh, uh, a mold from penicillin, which actually somehow uh, fell on this petri dish and then they started their antibiotic action. And when this guy returned back and he was washing his petri dishes, he realized that, uh, you know, this culture is almost gone. So, that is how it clicked his mind uh, and a revolutionary molecule came into picture. But this was done in 1928, still it took another uh, 12 years till 1940 when another scientists they were able to uh, isolate this molecule. And the first such penicillin molecule to be isolated was penicillin G. Advantages and certain features of this molecule is it is active against gram positive uh, bacteria. It is a non toxic molecule, but there are problems. The first problem is it is ineffective when taken orally. Uh, so, it has to be taken through intravenous injections. Second is it has a narrow spectrum of activity and the last one is there are certain bacterial strains which become resistant to this uh, particular penicillin and they become resistant due to uh, having this particular enzyme in them which is beta lactamase. Uh, so, uh, it is very sensitive to this enzyme. Okay? So, let us now see how to get around these problems. Uh, so, to overcome these advantages, we must synthesize certain penicillin analogues, right? And in order to do that, we must do certain structure activity studies of penicillin. So, we must figure out what features of penicillin are important for activity. And uh, by saying it in other words, we need to describe the pharmacophore which penicillin presents. Now, what we see is uh, in, in this penicillin molecule that you got to have this lactam ring. I told you this beta lactam ring is very essential. Then you must also have a uh, amide bond through this sixth carbon. Okay? And at this fifth and sixth positions of carbon, one should have a cis, uh, cis stereochemistry of these two hydrogens. And also at this carbon number 3, one should have a carboxylic or free acid present. So, all these are essential features, all these actually constitute the required pharmacophore for this structure. It should be a bicyclic system also. So, now keeping this pharmacophore in context, let us try to alleviate some of the problems we just uh, figured out. And one problem I told you that it needed to be taken uh, through intravenous injections because this beta lactam compound is highly sensitive to acids. Okay? And that is quite understandable because this is a four membered ring, it is a strenuous ring. So, as soon as there is a there is even a catalytic amount of acid, this ring will uh, like to fall apart and will like to open up 
in this manner. So this is uh, a, a hydrolytic reaction uh, in the presence of an acid. There is another way also of opening up of this uh, lactam link and that is through neighboring group participation of this acyl group here. Okay? So this acyl group can also donate a pair of electrons to this carbon and uh, in the presence of an acid this will actually forge this will actually force this molecule this lactam ring to fall apart. Now in order for this to happen your oxygen should be high uh, you know sufficiently uh, electron rich okay so electron density should be quite high on this oxygen right. So we cannot do much about this aspect uh, the first aspect but we can certainly try to modify a compound uh, in context of this second problem that is uh, the neighboring group participation uh, which is resulting in falling apart of this ring. What we can do? Well as a synthetic chemist what you can think of is you can add an electron withdrawing group to this carbonyl uh, compound to this, this structure here right. So having an electron withdrawing group here will actually migrate electron density towards this end uh, rather than kind of pumping electrons on this oxygen. Now if you don't if you do that and oxygen is deprived of uh, you know uh, of electron density it is very difficult for this oxygen to participate in uh, the kind of cyclization reaction as we saw in the previous slide and opening up of this back, uh, lactam ring. So based upon this fact certain molecules came up in market like oxaciline, like penicillin 5, like ampicillin and if you notice all these compounds you would realize there is uh, an intervention of one or more uh, heterocyclic uh, sorry one or more electro negative uh, heteroatom here be it oxygen, be it nitrogen uh, in uh, or others in this case okay and in all these cases they were found more acid stable uh, components more acid stable analogues in comparison to penicillin. Now coming to the second problem I mentioned and that happens with the uh, uh, penicillin resistant bacteria which contains this enzyme beta lactamase and this enzyme again act on this beta lactam ring uh, rips apart this, uh, this linkage here this lactam linkage here and opens up the ring. Okay? Now again going by our knowledge which we have accrued so far we would probably uh, you know can think of making certain changes certain minor changes. So one such change keeping all the active residues keeping all the pharmacophoric units intact. So one such change we thought of was adding a bulky group here. The scientists decided that they could find an ideal shield in the form of a bulky group which should be large enough to ward off a lactamase enzyme which means it should be large enough so that this molecule will no longer fit into the active site of lactamase ring, uh, lactamase enzyme. But it should not be that big or it should be small enough to allow penicillin to do its duty. It means it, sh it should be just large enough to be able to not fit into this lactamase but it should not be that large that it is not fitting into the cell wall okay, and do its job, rip apart the cell wall. So based upon that other classes of compounds came into picture like oxaciline, like cloxaciline, like uh, this uh, fluclozaciline and you see in all these structures you would have this additional aromatic ring here chloro substituted aromatic ring in this case so that it creates a certain level of steric cloud onto this particular uh, active scaffold. Okay. So this has been found uh, to be you know a class of penicillins which were uh, not uh, which were also effective on beta lactamase resistant uh, compounds uh, bacteria. Okay. Now with this we move to the last topic in hand and that is about antiseptics and disinfectants if antibiotics were compounds which were uh, effective against bacteria, antiseptics and disinfectants uh, are compounds which are basically broadly active against several other microorganisms and they need not really kill the organism but they can also grow uh, stop their growth uh, as well. So we talk of um, uh, antiseptics which destroy or inhibit growth of microorganisms disinfectants these are chemical agents which are used to inanimate objects or surfaces 
Uh, certainly disinfectants are more toxic and stronger uh, in case of uh, in comparison to antiseptics. The compound we are going to see here is uh, uh, chlorhexidine which is uh, an active component of sablon uh, widely available in market. It is just 7.5 percent of this compound here and <coughs> uh, this compound can also act as an antiseptic. If you increase this ratio here the same compound can also behave as disinfectant uh, okay, by increasing the uh, ratio of this molecule. When we talk of mechanism of action of this particular molecule as you could note that this molecule is a positively charged compound you have all these guanidine units which are positively charged. So, these positively charged units uh, in this molecule they actually uh, come close to negatively charged phosphate groups on the cell wall of a bacteria or other microorganism. Uh, then what happens is it because you know uh, they would kind of attract each other it find its way into the cell wall it is actively transported into the uh, through this cell wall into the cell uh, there is an interaction between this molecule and phosphate molecules and once it enters the cell it actually ruptures the cell wall here and leakage of these uh, you know certain inner molecules for example ATPs and all will take place and opens up the cell and cell will die. Okay. So, that is the mode of action of uh, this drug uh, and other uh, antiseptic molecules also. So, with this we are coming close to this third lecture and I will just briefly revise what we did in today's lecture. We started with antacids, I described functioning of antacids, I spoke about systematic, non-systematic and other antacids and how they behave. Then I moved on to an entirely different class of antacids which are antihistamines and I told you I spoke about there being H2 antagonists and how they are designed and how an effective molecule cimetidines and others were designed. Uh, then I moved on to uh, analgesics and analgesics we studied were of the kind which were psychoactive also which were able to effectively cross blood brain barrier and in this case we discussed morphine and its analogs. Then we moved on to tranquilizers and I spoke about there being GABA inhibitors and uh, then we discussed some of the molecules diazepine and barbiturates as tranquilizers and how they act how they act as agonists uh, instead of antagonists as we saw in case of analgesics in this particular case. Finally, we came to uh, antibiotics and antiseptics. In case of antibiotics, we studied two different mechanisms of uh, bacterial uh, killing. First was their compounds acting as antimetabolites. In this case, we studied sulfonamides and in another case, we studied how the molecules can actually uh, act on the cell wall and in this case we studied penicillin and finally uh, we studied antiseptics and disinfectants. Uh, this lecture was uh, heavily borrowed and prepared from these sources and I recommend students they can go to these sources to read more about all of these uh, uh, all of the contents of today's lecture. I uh, wish you all the good luck and thank you very much for staying with me uh, for this third lecture. I hope to see you in the fourth and concluding lecture on this series. Thank you very much.